Hi, this is Patrick Scott. Welcome back to PLS 101. Today we're going to continue our discussion about campaign financing and the campaign and how to go about reforming our, our campaign finance system. Uh, some of the limitations of the reform as well as some of the benefits and poss possible ways, other, other suggestions in terms of how the system might be further reformed. But as we were talking last time we met, uh, we were talking about the fact that, you know, that campaign financing is a big, big business and in a lot of ways um, the amount of money flowing into campaigns um, are, is, is really huge, but on the other hand, uh, it's very, very difficult to reform the system, and as I mentioned, in a lot of ways, we have this almost like a Swiss cheese effect uh, with respect to campaign finance reform because there is, in a lot of ways, some, some holes in our system that cannot be plugged up. And so I want to talk about some of those issues today. Um, we're, first of all, what we were talking about the last time we met about the role of political action committees and how they can raise a lot of money and, and how they, they have limits in terms of direct contributions, but there are also, uh, as far as indirect contributions, there are no limits. And because these PACs are allowed to raise money, there has been a vast increase in, the, the, in the, both the number of PACs and also in the amount of money spent by PACs um, over the last 30 years or so. Um, for example, PACs grew from just a few hundred in 1977 to over 5,000 PACs today all across the country. And during that same time, contributions to presidential and congressional uh, candidates rose from 25 million to over 400 million in the most recent election. Um, the reform that have been in place through the FECA, which allowed the rise of political action committees, basically what that meant was that it shifted control of campaign money away from the parties more toward individual candidates. And that has had a further effect in terms of weakening the party system. And these reforms that we have t seen taking place with the FECA have made wealthy candidates, uh, have given them a, 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 an advantage over candidates with no money on, on their own. Now, one of the things that I see as the biggest problem or that biggest hole in the Swiss cheese that alludes to this idea of indirect PAC contributions is uh, a larger set called independent expenditures. You can think of independent expenditures as comprising, like a Venn diagram, um, the largest category, that, that category of independent expenditures is comprised largely of these indirect PAC contributions, but they could also be just indirect individual expenditures as well. If I'm a millionaire, I'm not necessarily following my money through a political action committee, but I'm actually, if I chose to run advertisements on behalf of a candidate or against his or her opponent, I can still do this, okay? So in a lot of ways, independent expenditures are comprised of both indirect PAC contributions as well as individual contributions that are not coordinated with a candidate's campaign. These again are indirect individual contributions, okay? So that's what we mean by independent expenditures. And so these are funds that are spent for or against a candidate by an organization or individual not directly connected to a candidate. Now, the Supreme Court, Court ruled in 1976 in Buckley versus Vallejo that said that the exercise of independent expenditures is constitutionally guaranteed. It is a form of freedom of speech. And so because of that, what the Supreme Court essentially did is it solidified or reinforced that major hole in the Swiss cheese. So you know that indirect PAC contributions and indirect individual uh, contributions are going to continue to play a major role in terms of the financing of campaigns in the future. And, and what's interesting is that these are outside the scope of accountability requirements or disclosure. And, um, and it, again, it's, it's considered a form of freedom of speech. Now, a major milestone that took place in 2002 was something called McCain-Feingold Bill. It, it, the McCain-Feingold Bill was named after uh, Senate, uh, a Democratic senator and a Republican senator, John McCain and Russ Feingold. Uh, this McCain-Feingold Bill finally made it into law and was called the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act of 2002. That bill, interestingly, took 17 years to become a law. It would come up for consideration again and again and somehow end up being filibustered or, or not considered to come up for a vote 
or other procedural tactics were employed uh, to keep it from coming up from a vote. Um, interestingly, again, the reason why, uh, the, this is how we, we, John McCain in part became famous and developed the rep reputation as being a maverick in the U.S. Senate was because he was very much for campaign finance reform. His view in particular was he was concerned about something called soft money. And soft money contributions are basically money that is, that's given to political parties um, for basically party building activities, for getting out the vote drives and things like this. And they, again, sort of like the indirect PAC contributions, came outside a full disclosure requirement. And up to $500 million per campaign, you know, per, per year sometimes uh, for all campaigns, and uh, national campaigns, um, sometimes you saw soft money totals of about $500 million or so. And so John McCain and Russ Feingold felt like that was just too much money in the system. So the, so the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act actually banned soft money. And so um, the, uh, that, that was designed to stop that and provide for more full disclosure requirements. Now, that bill became law in March of 2002, and interestingly, the Republicans had been the strongest opponents to it, but it was, yet, it was President Bush who ended up signing that bill into law. Uh, his father, George H.W. Bush, had 10 years earlier vetoed that very same bill. And again, what that bill did was ban unlimited soft money contributions, and that was something that the Republicans particularly benefited from. And it also curbed the use of something called issue ads. And these were ads that targeted candidates just days before an election. Uh, the bill also doubled the amount of individual contributions at the time from $1,000 to $2,000. And then it indexed it since that point in time. Um, but in my view, in a lot of ways, the, the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act really didn't solve the problem of campaign finance reform. Basically, it plugged up a hole, but that money found a new hole, all right, that was created. And let me talk a little bit about this new hole. This is sort of the new, the new player uh, on, on the landscape of political, you know, of campaign finance. The new players are groups called 527s, okay, They're, or 527 groups. These are groups that are formed. They are tax-exempt organizations. They engage in political activities. Uh, that often through unlimited contributions. Most 527s are advocacy groups trying to influence federal elections through getting voters to mobilize, come out to vote, uh, and they also will run these issue ads that tout or criticize a candidate's record. Um, for the 2008 election, just to give you an example, the top 50 donors are estimated to have contributed more than $600 million dollars uh, for, you know, through the 527 process. The name of 527 comes from Section 527 of the Internal Revenue Code, and this is a provision that opens the way for groups to raise money and spend unlimited uh, sums on political activities without any disclosure as long as they do not explicitly advocate voting for or against a specific candidate. All right? so. The 527s use this money, a lot of money now we're talking about, for advertising, for conducting polls, for telephone banks, for direct mail appeals. And these are really all the major functions of a c candidate uh, will use or a political party will use, but without the requirements for public disclosure or accountability. And that's, that's the reason why um, they have come under some criticism, because th this is a lot of money that, can ba that basically bypasses the formal disclosure or accountability process. And even unlike a political action committee, which are regulated by the election, Federal Election Commission, because they work uh, on, can, you know, sometimes uh, provide money directly to the candidates, with the 527s, there's no cap on how much you can give uh, or spend or accept. Uh, there's no IRS gift tax or reporting for these. And so as long as a Section 527 group does not expressly advocate the election or defeat of individual candidates by including in their, their advertisements, for example, vote for or vote against somebody, there is no requirement for them to report to the Federal Election Commission how much money they're spending. So these groups are free, are free to engage in a lot of advertisements, uh, again, issue adv advertisements as well. And uh, in a lot of ways, I guess the problem is that 
voters often have a hard time distinguishing between these kinds of advertisements and regular times, ty types of advertisements that are directed specifically toward candidates. Um, in, in a lot of ways, what I'm, what I'm seeing here, even in terms of the money, uh, that five or six hundred million dollars in terms of the top five to seven groups that are spending money, that was a lot, very, very similar in terms of the amount, in terms of total soft money contributions. So I'm seeing almost that same amount of money that was plugged up in one hole through the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act of 2002, now coming into this other hole, again, about the same amount of money through the 527s. So it seems to me in a lot of ways the 527s are replacing the soft money contributions. Um, but on the other hand, I think a lot of that money, they'll have, they have these different 527 groups have their own websites like moveon.org. And they ask for individual contributions to run advertisements to, on TV or create new ads that they put on YouTube and other, other outlets as well. And as part of this, uh, that money, I think, is coming from smaller donors. So in a sense, even though there's a lot of money uh, that's still flowing around in the system, to some degree, the system has changed a bit because it seems to me that instead of a lot of bigger donors giving a lot of money, I mean, there's still plenty of that going on, by the way, but you're seeing a lot more smaller people, you know, the, you know, the little person, you know, giving money to these groups and to these candidates. And in a lot of ways, I think that, can, that, that may actually be a, re a relatively healthy sign for democracy. It may not be the total amount of money that's actually being used, but rather how much, how much that money is coming from one or two or three or a few handful of sources. If that money is being spread out among di many different people, among many different groups, going to many different candidates, in a lot of ways, and, and if the amount is in the, in the form of smaller donations, um, in a lot of ways that could actually be a pretty healthy thing for our democracy. Um, so that's what we have going on right now in terms of the 527s. Now the question is, all right, given the fact that there's a lot of money in our, uh, still circulating in our system, given the fact that we have holes like Swiss cheese in our system, what should we do to reform, further try to reform the system? And there have been some, some proposals that have been considered over, over uh, the course since 1971. And there's a couple of interesting ones here that I want to share with you. One um, suggestion that we've seen bandied about back and forth is the idea that maybe all federal campaigns, that is congressional campaigns, as well as um, presidential campaigns, should be publicly financed. In other words, like we do pr uh, financing of presidential campaigns, have all congressional campaigns also publicly financed. So your taxpayer dollars will finance their campaigns. Now a lot of people would be very much opposed to that naturally. Uh, but if you think about this, if you're an incumbent, let's say you're running for, con you're running for re election in Congress, public financing would free you up from having to spend all your time trying to raise money, trying to curry the favor of PACs and other interest groups. Uh, and though it, so therefore, it would allow you more time to do your job, which is to govern and make good policy. So in a lot of ways, that whole idea of the constant campaign that plagues Congress, they, they, would, they, would, have, they would get away from that. Uh, because after all, it does take a lot of time to raise money. And if you are an incumbent, this means taking time away from governing and policy making. The second argument for public financing is that campaigns have become so expensive that you have to be fairly wealthy and you have to have a, just an uncanny ability to raise a lot of money in order to run for office. I mean, if you think about the average cost to run for the Senate at $7.1 million, that's a lot of money we're talking about here. So maybe the idea behind public financing is that you could have more, more of the average person, the common man, if you will, or the common person uh, running for office if there was not so much money uh, being required to run for office. But on the other hand, if you said that incumbents and challengers had to spend the same level of money, think about this. You're automatically, this is the downside of that idea, you're automatically conferring an, uh, an advantage to the incumbent. Because in Congress, the incumbents have all these other kinds of advantages that we'll talk about later, but they have all these other kinds of advantages over their challengers. Uh, to, to reinforce you know, to, while they're in office. And again, just to give you a couple of examples, the ability to bring home the bacon, to please your constituents, to bring federal money to your, 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 your district, to get yourself visible all the time, to make all these trips back home to your district and meet your, your constituents, to send out newsletters to your constituents, tell them what a great job you've been doing over the past couple of years. I mean, think about this. This is two years worth of visibility and exposure that, you're, that the challengers do not have. 
So if you basically mandate public financing and say that even the challengers have to spend the same money as the incumbents, well, guess what? In a lot of ways, you've automatically conferred an advantage to the incumbents. And so then you question whether or not that might be a fair thing to do or not. Uh, some people have suggested is another possibility in terms of reforming our system is that what we ought to do is lower the cost of our elections by shortening our campaign seasons. Instead of having, for example, candidates for, for president announce a year and a half ahead of time that they're running for office, maybe shorten that season, or for members of Congress to shorten that season to only a, maybe a couple of months or a few months or even a few weeks perhaps, uh, as they do in many European uh, uh, elections. Um, so by doing that, it's going to reduce the amount of money involved. But on the other hand, again, you've got a potential disadvantage for the challengers to get themselves known to the public. Uh, so you see, again, you've got some problems here associated with each, each of these suggestions have advantages and disadvantages. Um, another suggestion that's been considered is the idea of providing free or low-cost television advertisements for campaigns. And the idea behind that is that, at least for the broadcast networks, they get these licenses, licenses to operate by the Federal Communications Commission. And so as part of that benefit that they get these licenses, they, maybe they're under obligation to provide free advertisements, you know, and, or, or low-cost advertisements. Um, you know, you're getting a free public resource by being able to broadcast over certain airwave spectrums, and so therefore, as part of that, uh, since you have access to the airwaves, this could be one of the requirements in return for getting this, this resource. Now, um, of course, broadcasters will be the first to lobby against that kind of proposal, and they've been very, very effective against lobbying that because obviously that would mean a major decline in their revenue uh, during campaigns. I mean, because as expensive as TV advertisements are, it's a major boon to broadcast owners of broadcaster stations and networks because they're getting all this money from these television advertisements. Um, some people also suggest that uh, we ought to set spending limits on campaigns according to the office and the size of districts. Um, but again, that again creates some potential constitutional issues or concerns. But the point here I want to share with you is that clearly reform is not an easy thing to achieve. Uh, reforms that are designed to solve one set of problems may very well end up creating another set of problems. I think personally, one of the best ways in which we can achieve reform is, um, or is, 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 is have what I was suggesting earlier, have more and more, ironically enough, have more and more people contribute to the process, contribute their time and their money involving in campaign, in campaigns and, and elections. If, if you have more of the average person playing an active role, having that sense of political efficacy, giving money uh, according to very, very clear limits and small donations from a whole huge number of donors, um, I think that might is actually one of the best ways to reform the system so that that creates a different kind of, of level playing field where you've got plenty of people supporting both say the, both candidates for the, pre, for, uh, uh, the president's uh, election, um, but you've got plenty on both sides, the Republican side and, and the Democratic side, uh, but, but they're all actively participating and engaged in the process. Actually, that might be a very important way to, to reform the system. So maybe our focus, again, should not be so much on how much money is in the system, but again, where it's coming from and the degree to which it's either being disclosed or not being disclosed. Now, I want to shift gears, moving away from um, campaign, uh, campaigns, uh, finance, and finance reform, and talk about another aspect of campaigns and elections. And this is something called presidential nominating conventions. Um, we, we need to spend a few minutes talking about that, and what, what it is and its importance. Um, basically, when, during the year in which a president is being elected, you know, 2004, 2008, coming up 2012, um, you will see in the summertime each of the major, each of the two parties having about a week to conduct their conventions. There is the, the Republican National Con, uh, uh, Convention and the Democratic National Convention. Um, basically, uh, I'm, the, the, I'm sorry, the Democratic Nominating Convention, the Republican Nominating Convention. Basically, these conventions take place normally around the summertime of the year in which the presidential election is, is occurring. Now, the question, the, the, the point here is though, you're, you're turning on your TV in the summertime and you're, and you're looking and you see that all the three major networks 
are actually uh, uh, broadcasting uh, during prime time and even during uh, throughout the day some of the, this, this convention taking place. Well, let's go inside the convention and just see for a minute what's going on here. If you look at the people there, the people are very, very excited there. These are the party faithful who are showing up and they're from all the different states all across the United States and they're delegates representing their state who are, are going to cast their uh, vote for their nominee. All right. Now, it used to be that the conventions were the places where the presidential nominees were actually selected. You didn't know until the conventions took place who was going to be the, the nominee for the Democratic Party for president or the nominee for the Republican Party. But, uh, and there was a lot of uncertainty about that. But nowadays, the conventions that take place are simply formally and officially ratifying the choices made by voters in each of the state's primaries and caucuses. And we're going to be talking about primaries and caucuses in just a bit. But basically what this is, is that when members of a party are announcing their candidacy for president, there might be many different people, for example, running for the Democratic nomination. Let's look at 2008, for example. We had Hillary Clinton running for president. We also had running against Barack Obama, running against John Edwards, running against Bill Richardson, uh, a lot of different candidates running for office on the Republican side for running for, uh, for to, to secure the Republican no uh, nomination. Um, we had John McCain running against Mitt Romney, uh, Rudolph Giuliani, um, many different uh, candidates on both sides. Mike Huckabee uh, as another, another candidate. Um, so what we see happening early on uh, is basically, and this, this begins during the year in which the president will be elected. The president's elected in November uh, every four years. Well, this, this starts back early part in, you know, really the year before, but the ball really gets rolling with the primaries that start in uh, about fe January and February. And uh, we're going to be talking, uh, the very first thing that starts off with, with the Iowa caucus in January, and then the first primary is, is the, Democrat, is the uh, New Hampshire primary that takes place in February. But basically, this is where the candidates within each party vie for your votes. You're going to go and vote in the caucuses or in the primaries, basically selecting your party's nominee. Who do you want to be the Democratic nominee? Who do you want to be the Republican nominee? And this is taking place basically from January all the way through about June of that presidential election year. Now really by about March, we already have a pretty good sense of who's going to be the nominee. But sometimes it doesn't take place even till even longer beyond till about June or July. Certainly by the time that the nominating conventions do take place, we already now have the tally, the state by state tally of the primaries that ha and caucuses that have taken place in each state. So for example, in the Republican nominating convention, they've already now at this point have to understand who's going to be the nominee because which candidate has won all the primary, the, the most of the primaries, and therefore most of the delegates in uh, for for the nominee. Like back in 2008, in the presidential election, uh, the the number of delegates that were needed to win, and basically it's like a state by state horse race for for uh, uh, securing the party's nomination. Um, by the time the conventions occur, we know who's going to be nominated for that party. And so essentially then, when the, when the nominating conventions do occur, they're simply for announcing f the winner of all the primaries and caucuses. Uh, the, the national conventions are also responsible, as a second thing, is to, they're responsible for writing the party platform. And the party platform is basically the key values and ideas, the key principles, and, and the key areas of policies that the party wants to achieve uh, over the next um, coming uh, couple of years. Now, the, the, who are these delegates, these people that you see on TV who are waving their signs and they're very, very happy and they're very excited about being there? These convention delegates are the party faithful. These are the activists. These are the ones who tend to be very ideologically oriented. They're highly educated. Um, Oftentimes, these delegates are chosen in state primaries actually to go and be a delegate to uh, these uh, nominating conventions. So the voters in each of the state-by-state -state primaries select delegates who pledge to support one of the candidates for a given party. And some states have what's called a winner-take-all primary, like South Carolina or Arizona. 
So the, the winner of that primary wins all the delegate votes. So there may be maybe uh, like 100, 100 delegates up for grabs. Uh, in a winner take all, whoever the, in, in, in that particular party, whoever wins that election, that primary election, will win the all 100 delegates. Um, anyone who wins the most votes gets all the delegates and all those delegates will be pledged to support the winning candidate. And other states are, are not winner take all, like Georgia. Um, they basically are based on, on the proportion of the vote. And so um, if I win 30% of the uh, primary in Georgia among the party faithful, I'll get 30% of the delegates at the national convention. And it's basically through the accumulation of state by states, all these different vote counts, you know who's going to be the, no the, the nominee uh, by the time that those conventions do occur. During our next segment, we're going to be talking more specifically about the different kinds of elections that are out there. We're going to be talking about uh, the difference between caucuses and primaries, the, the various kinds of primaries, and uh, we'll also get into a little, some discussion about the Electoral College, what it is, how it works, what its purpose, what's good about it, what might need to be changed about it. So until then, this is Patrick Scott from Political Science 101. Thank you very much.